So I have the honor of introducing our speaker, uh, Robin Collins. I first discovered Robin's work when I was a computer science undergrad, and I was discovering these articles on the internet about this new design argument from fine tuning, and I was very fascinated by it. Uh, but I was also troubled by some objections. So I was thinking about these objections, and you know, what do you do when you discover uh, an intellectual leader on a topic and you have questions about their work, well, you send them an email. So I emailed Robin, and he replied. And he gave me a very detailed set of responses to my questions. And to this day, I remember that email because I felt like it contained both wisdom as well as a style of describing a set of options that I thought was very interesting. He didn't just give me kind of one answer. He gave me a few things to consider and kind of think about for myself. So I've appreciated that, and I've grown to appreciate uh, Robin's work uh, more and more over the years. And um, I have the pleasure of um, getting to know him more and to be a friend of his. And here, I want to just say that um, he's just very well known in the field uh, of philosophy, but also many scientists are getting to know his work. He has written over 50, uh, 50 articles and book chapters in philosophy with some of the leading academic presses spanning the areas of the philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, and the philosophy of religion, as well as philosophical theology and the philosophy of mind. He has given invited talks at many places, uh, including Oxford University, Cambridge University, Stanford University, Yale University, and at many other places around the world. Um, he's been interviewed on the Closer to Truth um, uh, uh, video show and PBS and other places. Um, people are very interested in his work. Professor Collins' recent work explores how the laws and fundamental parameters of the universe appear not only to be finely tuned for life, but optimized for our ability to do science and to discover the universe. He's recently received a large grant to pursue this research from uh, the Templeton Foundation. And this morning, he's going to be talking about a kind of classic fine-tuning argument uh, in the afternoon. He'll talk about some of his latest discoveries on the discoverability work that he's been doing, and I'm very excited about both of these. So thank you, Robin, and go for it. All right. Thank you, um, Josh. And thank you, everybody, for being here. I know it's a, for students especially. It's a Saturday morning, and you, so you gave up sleeping in to come here, so that's impressive. So let me begin here. So what I'm going to talk about is called the fine-tuning design argument. It's an argument from physics and cosmology for the divine creation of the cosmos. And it covers one of the big issues in science and um, God. Um, a lot of times you get it portrayed that somehow sci science undercuts belief in God. But I think what they've discovered in physics and cosmology, just the reverse is true. Actually, the discoveries in science support the existence of God. Now, the design argument I'm going to talk about actually has a very long history, both in the East or the West and the East. So it's ancient India. There is the design argument for theistic versions of I mean, virgins of Hinduism that hold to the existence of a personal creator. The Stoics in ancient Greece held to a version of the design argument, and famously Thomas Aquinas in more um, in the late Middle Ages. And then a kind of the design argument in general, which is an argument from the apparent design of some aspects of the world to the existence of God sort of in the past reach its first, at least its first high point with the publication of William Paley in 1802, the apparent design of plants and animals. They looked like they were structured like in his famous watch analogy. They were like a watch, like the heart. And so it looked before Darwin, there was either God or chance. And then after Darwin, there came the theory of evolution by means of chance, um, natural, selection, um, um, natural selection. And that people found that a uh, viable alternative. So the design argument 
um, took a sort of hit for a long, uh, significant period of time. Until more recently, and that by more recently it's about 50 years ago, people started noticing that the very structure of the universe, as I show here, right there, the very structure of the universe was um, set just right so that life could occur. It was like a biosphere. And I have an example of a now defunct biosphere in Arizona that is a self-contained area that um, is meant for life, to, uh, for life can exist in it. And the biosphere in Arizona was not fine-tuned enough, so too many toxins built up, and so the people had to evacuate it. But the universe was fine-tuned, set just right, and that's why we're here. So we first, when you say it's set just right for life, we have to ask what is the kind of life you're talking about? So the relevant kind of life for this purposes of this argument is what I call embodied conscious agents. They're beings like us, or if you're a Star Trek fan, they could be Klingons or Romulans or um, hobbits, if you like Lord of the Rings. Um, they're beings that are embodied and conscious, and those beings, for their existence, require stable, reproducible complexity. So the fine-tuning argument is really about what are the conditions for stable, reproducible complexity, and the idea is things have to be set ex uh, exceedingly precisely in order for those stable, reproducible complexity to exist. So there's three types of fine-tuning for life. There's a fine-tuning of the laws of nature. That's just the general structure of the law, like there's a law of gravity that says, you know, masses attract each other. So if I drop this, oops, that's gravity. Then there's the fine-tuning, and I'll talk about this more, of what's called the constants of physics, or I think a better word is the fundamental parameters of physics. So hang on for that. And then there's the fine-tuning of the initial distribution of mass energy at the beginning of the universe. So let's first look at the laws. So to say that the laws are fine-tuned, what I mean there is if the laws weren't per what they are, if you had, let's say, a, you deleted one of the laws of nature, then you wouldn't be able to have complex, stable, reproducible complexity occur, highly complex life. So I'm gonna consider five of around 14 examples. So first of all is the one where I had just mentioned the force of gravity or the law of gravity. So that says uh, masses attract each other. So we could do a thought experiment and ask ourselves, what would the universe be like if there weren't any gravity? And so if there were no gravity, there'd be no stars because the universe, there's all this matter be uniformly distributed. The reason it clumps up into stars is there's slight, um, in, there's slight differences in the density and the gravitational attraction pulls the star together. It gets very hot and then nuclear fusion occurs in the star. And so then you have a star and the, mass, the gas is very hot. It would just, if there wasn't any gravity, it would just expand and there wouldn't be any star anymore. So, and also for planets, for a place for the life forms to evolve or exist on, there needs to be planets, which requires the masses clumped together. So then there's also the electromagnetic force. Um, so I talked about gravity, which is a force, but there's also the force of elect, um, electromagnetism, which is a unification of the magnetic forces so what you have, if you have a magnet, there's a force of either repulsion or attraction if you put two magnets together. And what you've all learned about, you should have at least some point, the electric force. And James Clerk Maxwell unified the two forces in the late 1800s. So let's just look at if there weren't any electric force, then there wouldn't be any atoms because you need the electric force in order for the, here's the positively charged protons to keep 
the negatively charged electrons in orbit. And so there wouldn't be any chemical bonding. There wouldn't even be any atoms. So there wouldn't be the basic building blocks for life. Now, if you didn't have electromagnetic force, um, what's interesting about electromagnetism and the unification, um, they propagate as a light wave or a radio wave. So they form what's called an electromagnetic wave. So a light is an electromagnetic wave um, between its frequency, how many times it vibrates back and forth, between 400 and 700 trillion times a second. That's visible light. 400 is around the red, and 700 trillion is around the um, blue region. Your cell phones that you use use um, radio waves, which are electromagnetic waves, at the frequency of around um, two or so billion times a second, a lot slower than visible light. And so you need the visible light here is um, like for the planet, if you didn't have the, this combination of electromagnetism, you wouldn't have any way of getting the energy from the sun to the planet. And that's energy is needed for life. And the basic reason for that is the second law of thermodynamics, that things go from order to disorder. Um, as students, you're probably familiar with it, with your room. If you don't put energy back into your room, you know, just throw your socks and shirt over here. Pretty soon it gets completely disorderly. And so you have to have an energy source. It's really a, a source of what? Um, low entropy, a source of order. And you need that, and so you need some medium, something to carry that energy, and there we have um, light from the sun that does that. So this electromagnetic interaction between the electromagnetic um, forces plays a huge number of different roles. You could see it plays the role for the existence of an atom, it plays the role of getting energy from a star to the planet, and which I'll talk about more in the second talk, it plays a role in scientific discovery. It's because of that, because of James Clerk Maxwell and this unification of electricity and magnetism that we have all the science we have today. Um, the huge change scientifically occurred around 1900, right after Maxwell's theories, and you had electric motors, you had radio waves, all this stuff. So we went from like a horse Within 100 years, we went from horse-drawn buggies and hand-delivered messages to the internet, social media, and everything we have today, and it's because of this electromagnetic force. It played a huge role. So it's here's this interesting thing. I went a little more in detail than I normally do in that, but it's, things are also ingeniously designed so that one thing, the electricity and magnetism, can play many different roles. And we see that happening here. OK, so we already talked about the atom. We talked about the energy getting to the planet. We talked about the building block of the atom. So we might think, OK, with the electric force and protons and neutrons, OK, we've got the building blocks for life. We have the atom. But then when atom was first proposed, they had around 1900, um, they recognized there was a problem. And we know that like charges repel each other. So the protons are positively charged. The neutrons are negatively are, um, neutral, not charged at all. So what holds them together? Does anybody know that? I'm just curious. What holds the protons and neutrons together? I mean, like charges repel each other. Well, here's the answer. Strong. The strong nuclear force. This was um, before I became a philosopher. I tried to run for the governor of California, but there was another guy who, I guess, just outcompeted me. <laughs> so anyhow, there has to be something to hold those together, and it has to have just the right forms. It's a short, very strong, short-range force, which means it's very much like this big guy. It can't reach very far, but you get in the big guy's grips then you're in trouble. So if the guy comes after you, just stay out of his grip. But if he didn't have that, if it was long range, like gravity reaches from the sun to the earth, then the nuclei of one atom would pull the nuclei of other atoms, and they would all come bunching together. 
And when they all came bunching together, it turned into a black hole and the whole thing would be over. So you see it's also not only having that force, but it has to have a special form. So it's another example of this fine tuning for the laws. So you might think you're done. Now you've got the nucleus and you've got electrons orbiting around it, but you're not done. Because the problem is electrons, if a charge is not moving in a straight line at a constant velocity, it emits electromagnetic radiation. That's how your cell phones work. There's little electrons on the teeny antenna inside and they're bound, going back and forth about, about a billion times a second. And then they're emitting electromagnetic waves, which are picked up by the cell tower, and then those in turn retransmit them. Okay, so if the electrons are orbiting, they're not going in a straight line with a constant velocity, so they should be emitting electromagnetic radiation. So if you were building the atom to get it to work, you'd have to add another ingredient. So in 1913, Niels Bohr hypothesized another ingredient, the principle of quantization. So he hypothesized that electrons only can occupy fixed orbitals. So they can't go in more than the lowest orbital. They have to be in one of those orbitals that are fixed. And there's a deeper theory for that we have now called quantum theory for why that's the case. It's a mathematical theory. But you have to have that. Now you might think, oh, I'm done. I've got my atom. No, you're not done. You have to have another ingredient. So what's the other ingredient? Did anybody know what that is? Probably not. It's, uh, here's going to be your problem. Even with the principle of quantization, you know, like things like to fall to their lowest energy state, like unless something, this is going to fall to a lower energy state by the attractive force unless it stops at the table. And then if I push it off the table, it'll fall to the floor. So all the electrons then would fall to the lowest orbital if you didn't add another ingredient. Well, there is another ingredient called the Pauli exclusion principle. And that principle requires that for the case of electrons, that not more than two electrons could occupy a single orbital. So it forces more and more electrons to go out. Now, why is that important? Well, if they all went to the first orbital, you wouldn't have complex chemistry. So there wouldn't be life, there wouldn't be biochemistry. It's really the biochemistry, what's responsible for it is the configuration of electrons in the outer orbitals. So there'd be no life without this, but it's worse than that. It's worse than not getting complex material. It's also that if you don't have this, it was, and it was proved in the 1960s, that in, within like a millionth or a billionth of a second, all matter would collapse in on itself. So the very existence of solid matter, like you can walk on, is just a result of this principle, okay? That's what it's a result of. The principle says, this has to be the case, so matter be solid. Now, when I first learned that, it was quite, I, I, when I was working on this stuff, I had often a visceral sense of how miraculous it was. So I just remember walking across the street that I could actually walk on a street, that there was actually solid things you can set in a chair, that something we take for granted is actually goes down to just like, it's almost like a line in a code that says this has to be the case. And there's no further physical explanation for it. And that's the way it was um, with this. If it didn't exist, then you would, there wouldn't be any world, that we, uh, um, physical world at all. So the conclusion here is that the, um, you have to have just the right laws. And I've only given, like I like said, one, two, three, five of um, about 14 examples. You have to have just the right set of laws in order for life to exist. So that's what I call the fine tuning of laws. Now here's where the most of the fo focus has been in the physics literature on this, and that's the fine tuning of the constants. Um, I think a better name form is the fundamental parameters of physics. These are numbers that occur in the fundamental equations of physics, the laws I talked about. So let's look at one of these laws. This is proposed in around 1680. This is Newton's, Isaac Newton's law of gravity. It was the first real explanation of why um, objects are attracted 
and fall to the earth. And so this is given by an equation here that says the force of attraction, like the force between my body and the earth, when I'm standing on it, is given by this number G, that's Newton's um, gravitational constant, times the first mass, let's say that's me, times the second mass, that's the mass of the Earth, and then divided by the distance here, r, between me and the center of gravity of the Earth. And if you then multiplied that by g, you would get the force. So I weigh about um, 75 kilograms. And my weight is always, always stays the same. If I eat too much, I just get really hot and burn off the energy. If I don't eat enough, I get cold. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's like got this set point. And um, so let's suppose I double G. Now that's about 150 pounds, 75 kilograms. So 150 pounds, if I double G, then the you know, weight, the pound is the force. That's in physics, the kilograms is the mass, the pounds is the force, what you see on the bathroom scale. So if I double G, I would still be 75 kilograms, but now I would weigh, bathroom scale would read 300 pounds. And if I um, made G one half, the bathroom scale would read 75 pounds. So you can see how G is very important for what the force of gravity would be on a planet. So um, I'm doctor, known as Dr. Collins, so I'm gonna give just one piece of medical advice um, during this talk. If you want to lose weight, don't try changing G. That's the hard way. Change M right here. Okay, that's my medical advice. Okay, so how fine-tuned is the strength of gravity as given by G? So first we have to look at the range of force strengths in nature. So we've got to look at a scale here. So remember I talked about the strong nuclear force. That's really, really strong compared to gravity. And there's a way of a standard dimensionless measure of force strengths you could use. But you could think of it as the force between like two protons in a nucleus, which participates in all the forces. So gravity would be extremely small because gravity, in order to have much of a force at all, requires huge numbers of protons like you have in the sun or the earth. And in fact, the strong nuclear force here is the strongest of them all. It's about 10 to the 40th power. That's one followed by 40 zeros stronger than gravity. That's 10,000 billion, 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 billion times the strength of gravity. So just in nature, that's your range of force strengths. Now, to give you an idea of how much that is, think of a ruler. You could stretch a ruler across the entire visible universe, about 15 billion light years. A light year is how far light travels in a year, which tra light travels 186,000 miles a second, and there's 86,000 seconds approximately in a day. And there's 365 or 64, or 65 and one fourth days in a year. Multiply that out, that's how far light travels in a year. Then multiply that by 15 billion, you get the length of your ruler. So our strength of our gravity here is in the first trillionth of an inch. So that we're getting the ruler, how large it is. And now we have to look at how fine tuned gravity is. So we can do these thought experiments. So what if we increase gravity by one part in 10 to the 34th? That's one followed by 34 zeros. Uh, that would correspond to a billion fold increase in gravity, but that wouldn't even get us to the first inch. So we'd still be only at the thousandth of an inch on that ruler. So in that world, even single celled organisms would be crushed um, on our planet. You wouldn't be able to have any form of life and certainly not embodied conscious agents like ourselves. And you'd have to shrink the planet to around 100 feet in diameter, in which case you wouldn't have an ecosystem that could support beings like us. So you just wouldn't get a universe with um, embodied conscious agents. So this is what happens to life forms in a strong gravity world. 
In fact, to do more precise calculations, we have to have an app. In order for beings like us, oxygen is really essential. And um, so in order to have an atmosphere, our atmosphere is slowly dissipating, um, but it's kept in place by the Earth being strong enough, um, gravity of the Earth being strong enough. So to get this all to work out, if you like increased gravity by a beer 400 fold increase, the surface force would have to be 10 times as large. So it's not a billion fold increase anymore. It's actually much more modest compared to the range of force strengths to get a world that's really workable. That's not, everything's not so heavy that we um, couldn't deal with it and could actually exist. Okay. So there's a further fine tuning there. So if you look at what would be optimal for life to exist, beings like us, it's a much narrower range you would need for that um, constant G. And especially when you look at um, optimality for science and technology. So here's an analogy to how much fine tuned it is. So it's a radio station analogy. These are the radios I grew up with. That was before digital radios and you had a little dial. How many have seen those before? Have seen those before? Okay. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, we'd have to tune them in. It's ecstatic and finally you'd get that radio station in if you tuned it in just right. And back east they're called WK. They start with W and out here, I grew up initially in California. Um, all the stations start with K. So if you can imagine you have to tune this in to get the station K life, and you'd have to tune it in on this dial to just this right region in that first trillionth or um, first thousandth of an inch over this 15 billion year length of the ruler. So extremely fine tuned. Okay, that's one example. Now here's another one called the cosmological constant, or I think the better is talk about in terms of it's called the dark energy density. That's what it's associated with now, which is, I'll talk about some in my second talk. The universe has, um, there's, it's 4% four, 4 matter as we know it, and 70% of the universe is dark energy, which is energy just permeates space. And that has to be fine-tuned to an extremely um, fine value in order for life to exist. If it's too large, then the universe will expand way too rapidly for galaxies to form and then stars to form and to have beings like us. And if it's too small, then the universe will collapse back in on itself very quickly and before anything can form. So how fine-tuned is it? Well, here's a standard estimate not one part in 10 to the 40th power, but one part in 10 to the 120th power. Unimaginably amount of fine tuning. This is actually the most discussed one in the physics literature. So has to be for the station life or that ruler has to be just in this really tiny region of a trillionth of a trillionth of an inch around zero. <coughs> So all the constants must be just right in an exceedingly narrow range for life to occur. And this is widely recognized. So we have the late Stephen Hawking, um, who wrote in his book, A Brief History of Time, about how these numbers have to be finely adjusted, he says, to make possible the development of life. You have Dennis Diama at formerly director of Cambridge University's um, you change a little bit the laws of nature, the change a little bit the constants of nature, it is very likely that intelligent life would not have been able to develop. So those were examples I gave of the laws or the constants, those fundamental numbers you have to put in. I didn't say why those constants are necessary. Well, I want to go back just a little bit just to hammer that one in. I talked about the, const, uh, the gravitational constant. If I just said masses attract each other, are they supposed to do it very little or a lot like this? That number G tells how much it's supposed to happen. So it has to be specific so 
the objects know what to do. It's like you have to write a, um, um, the laws of nature. Matter only does what you tell, is a computer science phrase. Computers only do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. And the same thing with matter. Everything has to be specified to detail what it's supposed to do in the universe. And that's what the laws, and they have to do with their constants or their fundamental numbers. So this is the most impressive one of them all. It's a fine tuning of the initial distribution of mass energy. And I give an analogy to that is here's the beginning of the universe. The analogy is over here. The beginning of the universe starts with what is called a big bang, which we see if we look out the universe, it's ex everything's expanding. Okay, space itself is expanding. And if we trace that back, then at some point in around 13.8 billion years ago, everything we see was compressed to less than the size of a basketball. Extremely hot, extremely dense. And then since that time, it's this hot, dense thing has been expanding out. And then as it expands out, it cools, and then you get atoms forming, then galaxies, and then eventually you'll get us. That's the famous um, uh, sculpture of a, a thinker and thinks about why we're here at all. Okay, so eventually we come into existence. So just like your body coming into existence has to, it comes out of the zygote, and the zygote has to be very finely, a lot of information here, there's a huge amount of structure. Though if you look at it from, if you don't look at it in detail, it looks like just a protoplasm, it doesn't look structured at all. Likewise with here, it just seems like a big ball of gas that's very hot, but actually it has to be extremely structured or fine-tuned in order for life to exist more than any, anything else. So how precise does it have to be? Well, here you can ask Roger Penrose, who's one of lead, Britain's leading theoretical physicists and cosmologists. And this is out of his book, The Emperor's New Mind. Now, he's not himself a theist, but he uses this idea of God as a way of illustrating these points. So he thinks about a uh, creator. And he says, in order to produce a universe like us that would allow for life, you have to, creator would have to aim for an absurdly teeny volume of phase space. Well, what is phase space? That's just the space of possibility, possible configurations of that battery energy at the beginning of the universe. So to give an idea of what phase space is, like if you flip two coins, then they could come up heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. Those are the set of possibilities. That's the phase space for flipping two coins. So this is the set of possibilities. And out of that set of possibilities, you, it's one, in order to get a life permitting universe, it has to be fine tuned to one part in 10. We're not talking here 10 to the 123rd. We're talking 10 to the 10 to the 133rd. So it's it's one followed by 10 to the 130 zeros. So it, that's just an enormously large number at the bottom, and that's an enormously <laughs> small number. So let's give an imaginative analogy to this. So let's suppose God gave me God's photocopying machine and an endless supply of paper and ink. And I took that photocopying machine and on the first page, I put a one. On the rest of the pages, I put zeros. And I filled the entire universe with them. And you'd have a number, one with all those zeros. That number would still not be as large as this number here. So you can see one over that number, how incredibly fine-tuned that would have to be. So it has to be unimaginably narrow range for life to exist. So fine tuning of laws, fine tuning of constants of physics, and then you have fine tuning of the initial distribution of mass energy in the universe. So three kinds of fine tuning. And then further, and I'll be focusing much more on this in the second talk, but for the living conditions within those laws, the kind of laws we have to be optimal, and 
it's optimal to develop science and technology. The constants have to be even further finely adjusted, and they seem to be. So that's plug for the afternoon talk when I'll talk about the fine tuning for science and technology. So here I begin to think about this way back in the early 90s where I first was a professor. And I used to use these circular dials to represent the parameters. I always like to draw images for my class. And so this was an image um, a student called Becky Warner drew for me and I really liked it. So I asked her if I could use it in the future. And so here's dials are perfectly set. There's life. Dials not perfectly set, no life. So that nicely illustrates the idea of fine tuning. And philosophers call this what the evidence you have for fine tuning a cumulative case argument. There's not just one instance, because if there's just one instance, you could say, oh, baby did the calculations wrong, or in various ways try to cast doubt on it. But it's that there's many different things all point in the same direction. So in a trial, let's say a murder trial, if you have fingerprint evidence, you have DNA evidence, you have the, a confession written by the defendant, you have witnesses, um, you have a motive, well, you've got a really strong case because they're all pointing to the defendant's guilt. So likewise here, you have initial conditions, constants of physics all point to the universe um, is, uh, has to be enormously fine-tuned for life to exist. So how can we explain that? Well, one suggestion is divine creation. Now, this was by, uh, um, this picture is by William Blake. Um, and I think he didn't particularly like what that portrayed, this particular thing, because it portrays an anthropomorphic God, and we'll talk about towards the end. That's not the right way to think about God in these circumstances, but it's nice for an image. So God fine-tuned everything here is the idea. And so it immediately suggests that, even for non-theists. So you have a non-theist, Paul Davy writes in one of his books on um, these uh, theoretical physicist and popular science writer, he writes in one of his books, the impression of design is overwhelming, he says, when you look at the universe. And then Sir Fred Hoyle, who found um, one of the first cases that was widely talked about, Hayes um, stated, it was a common sense interpretation of the fact suggests that a super intellect is monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces in nature. So what alternatives to non-theists offer to divine creation? So here's the two major alternatives. First alternative is lucky accident, brute fact hypothesis. That's just the way the universe is. No further explanation for it. So our existence is just an extraordinarily lucky accident. So many people find the brute fact um, hypothesis just incredible and unbelievable. So I have an image of Abraham Lincoln here, but since there's a lot of students in the audience, if you like shared an apartment or something in the refrigerator and you, know, you had a roommate that was, let's say, a biology major, and you finally go reach in the back there, and there's this old rotting tomatoes or something, and you go, once again, my oh, roommate's such a slob, and you pull it out. And then, on the pan where there's all those tomatoes is that picture that just looks like Abraham Lincoln. You would not think of all the fungi. You would not think that was just an accident. You'd think it was designed by your roommate because it'd be so improbable first for it to occur by chance and then it has significance. It has both high improbability and significance. When you get those two together, then you're, you don't, you find a chance explanation extremely implausible. Well, in the case of the universe, there's significance. We exist, life's, intelligent life seems to be significant. And it's far more improbable than getting that, the mold or fungi to form in that sort of image. 
So how much more so with the universe itself? So in light of that, a lot of people say, no, oh, that's way too implausible. So at least among physicists and cosmologists, few advocate this one. Rather, they go to this hypothesis, those who aren't theists, multiverse hypothesis, according to which there are an enormous number of universes with different initial conditions and values for the constants of physics and even the laws of nature. It's called the multiverse and it's reached popular culture. There is the, um, what was it, a Spider-Man movie about the Spider-Man and the multiverse? So it used to be when I first started working on this, this was just the idea of a multiverse would just talk among physicists and cosmologists. Now it's in popular culture. So it's this infinite realm, almost infinite realm of other universes, other realities with different laws. So under that view, will you get enough of these different realities with different laws, different fundamental parameters, values, eventually you're going to get one that's just right for life. And we then are winners of this cosmic lottery is the idea. And that has a lot of advocates, cosmologist Max Tegmark um, at MIT who have talked to about it. Same way as Sir Martin Rees, he was former astronomer Royal Owl of Great Britain. He advocated the multiverse as an explanation. And so did cosmologist Stephen Hawking in his book. Um, one of his books I'll just mention in a minute. So here are several books out on it. I have an article in this one on uh, multiverse a theistic perspective, um, edited by Cambridge University Press, edited by Bernard Carr. And then more recent after that book, this was recent in the, like um, around 2010, that kind of recent, the grand design where Stephen Hawking and them advocate this view. Now, this book happens to be, I think physicists sometimes get really arrogant and they think they can tell us all about reality and dismiss philosophy. So I'll just say this as an aside on page seven, they dismiss philosophy. We don't need philosophy anymore because we have cosmology to tell us about things. And then they go on to make statements like this, the universe created itself out of nothing, and they really mean nothing, because they repeat it several times, via gravity. And I think to myself, not even God can pull a trick like that. You can't create yourself out of nothing, because you gotta exist before you do. And then they make other things, like in the next page, that people used to think things are as they appear to be, um, but now we know better with quantum mechanics. And I'm going, oh, right. Um, you know, Christians in the past, they always thought everything was just as it appeared to be. No, they believed in a whole unseen realm. Copernicus, you know, but when they, he uh, proposed the earth goes around the sun, that's not the way it appeared to be that the earth rotates, it looks the other way. So anyhow, that just a kind of warning about that. Sometimes they um, think they can say everything about everything because they do science. Okay, and this multiverse then comes in the two major versions. That was an aside there. Um, one of them is the purely metaphysical version, not widely advocated. So um, David Lewis, a philosopher, a late, late David Lewis at Princeton University advocated this in one of his books. And um, also MIT um, cosmologist Max Tegmark, who I mentioned, at least, I don't know if he believes this, but he at least promotes it as a serious possibility. And that's the idea is every possible reality that's self-consistent exists somewhere in actuality. <laughs> so if you're a fan of, let's say, Lord of the Rings, you um, then take heart. As long as it's a consistent story, Gandalf exists somewhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't, there's no tunnels from one universe to another. So. Bad news is you can't go visit Gandalf and say how much you admire him, okay? So that's the idea then, of course, if every reality exists, then ours is going to exist, and many life-permitting ones are going to. The other one is the universe generator idea, and that is that there's some physical process that just generates these universes. And every time it generates a universe, then the Fundamental parameters and um, the initial conditions are arranged at random. And then 
um, eventually you're going to get one that just allows for life. Now, this is my cartoon image. They don't really believe this is out there, a machine doing this, but it's some physical process does it. And they usually fill that in with the idea of inflationary superstring theory, a very speculative theory that, um, that, so it's not completely off the wall. They have a speculative theory that would give you something close to that scenario, at least for the constants or those numbers and the initial condition. So what are possible theistic responses to this multiverse? Well, many have said, well, it takes more faith to believe in this than the many universes and a many universe generation than God. Some um, students would say, where did the universe generator come from? That's peeling back to what's called the cosmological argument. Um, the third one is the universe generator itself would need to be well constructed to produce a single life sustaining universe. And then there's another serious problem called the Boltzmann brain problem. And then this is by ap um, afternoon, I'll talk about this, doesn't explain the optimal universe for science and technology. But here I'm gonna focus on number three. And here's a third response. This is, I used to have a bread machine. Now it's a pot that has flowers in it. Um, so it quit working quite right. But the lesson from the bread machine is to even produce one decent loaf of bread, everything have to, had to be just right. Like if I forgot to put the yeast in, I would get hockey pucks out. It's happened several times. I was thinking of some philosophical issue. Okay, uh, can relate to that, Josh. <laughs> so, and I had to have just the right program. Those would be the right laws, so the right ingredients, all the right settings to get one decent loaf of bread. So how much more would it have to be the case with the universe generator? In other words, it would have to be well built. That's actually a brand name, so I just a little plug for that brand. You know by its name, it's good because it's called well built. Okay. And if you examine the inflationary superstring scenario, um, you get this the um, same you can see within the examination, that's what I do at uh, that book in the, um, that Cambridge University Press book is examine that hypothesis and show you actually, with that hypothesis, you need a lot of fine tuning of the generator itself. So you don't really escape the fine tuning. How did this get fine tuned becomes the problem. Okay, so it doesn't significantly undercut the fine tuning argument because it just pushes it back to that level, is the argument. Although theism is compatible with the Bini universe's hypo generator hypothesis, maybe just like God created a universe has many, many, many planets, maybe God decided to create a reality with many, many universes, just like there's many, many planets, given the infinite creativity of God. So I'm not necessarily against the Bini universe's hypothesis. I just don't think it's an adequate explanation of fine tuning, it just kicks it back one level. So overall summary is three responses to the fine tuning evidence, theism, multiverse hypothesis, and then the brute fact hypothesis. Against two, the multiverse requires design. And against three, because life is special, um, it is hard to believe the universe just occurred by chance. Um, that's the ink spill analogy. So we're kind of left then with theism, I would argue is the best explanation. Um, there's a further debate on the issue is the great debate at www.infidels.org. Um, and then I have a lot of additional people ask me various kinds of questions about this. I do want to cover this before I completely in the who designed God objection, but I think I'm gonna wait and see if you have questions first, because that's gonna be a real important one to address. This is the biggest objection always raised against like fine tuning or other kinds of design arguments. Like this is Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist. Um, uh, the God delusion book, the sole objection really to the design argument. 
How is it that we can know that these laws of nature can't be anything other? Other than what they are? Well, we do know they apply throughout the universe because, like, if you look at distant starlight, um, how do you know the chemical composition of stars? So you know that by they have a definite spectrum because of the way the atomic orbitals are. And if the laws were different, they wouldn't have the same spectra as they have. So we actually can tell the chemical composition without going to a test tube like of the sun or a distant star just by looking at the spectral composition of the light we get. Now, even if they did change in other parts of the universe, then you would have a kind of multiverse hypothesis. Different regions of space had different laws. So then if you raise that as a kind of objection, then you'd just be raising a multiverse objection. Though in the multiverse, you can't see these other universes because we know as much as we can see of our universe at least, the laws are consistently the same. There might be a slight variation in one of the constants, so the fine structure constant, and that's been up for debate whether that's actually the case or not in other parts of other epochs of the universe, but it'd be very small change. I have a similar question. Uh, if I recall correctly, before we actually discovered evidence of black holes, even though there was a mathematical description of black holes, there was still skepticism about whether or not that mathematics applied to physical reality. Right, right. So how do we justify uh, believing that these other fine-tuning parameters and the mathematics that come from it would have same physical description that we think of. Well, we do kind of trust our calculations on that sort of thing. But even in the case of black holes, that kind of, uh, let me just go back to the case of black holes. The skepticism arises because black holes are at the very edge of our models, where our models say they break down. Our models in physics break down if the, the gravitational force gets too strong, and then quantum mechanics comes into play when you have um, very, um, small distances. So it becomes a lot more speculative in those cases what happens by our own models. But in these cases, you know, it just, it's not gonna be speculative like if I change the um, gravitational constant. Let's suppose I made it one half it is now. We're, if there's anything to Newton's law at all, it's not speculative, you're not gonna weigh as much. Okay, that's just a kind of obvious consequence. We're not looking at the very edges of what are physical theories of, of their applicability, which we know they're kind of questionable, their applicability in those areas. Um, over here, what's your name? Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, I have a two quick questions. Uh, one is, are we all winners of our own cosmic lottery? And the things that are things that we can do into the, the spiritual world, and it, it kind of moves us into the yeah, I mean, some people's views of reality do hold that kind of thing. In fact, there's um, views in Buddhism, for instance, that hold that it's all of our karmic energies together that bring us together in this reality. But it wouldn't be part of the physics fine tuning. It'd be part of a much larger metaphysical view of what our um, spiritual life does, or own thoughts do, and all that sort of thing. Okay. And then the next question was um, the stars in the sky mm -hmm. being a reflection of, of humanity on Earth. Does that be the <coughs> stars in the sky like the light in the dark? And I guess from a spiritual standpoint, I think that that to me is kind of a revelation like God, the existence of God. So the heavens declare the glory of God. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yes. Yeah, so I think that's much more so in what we've discovered in the last 100 years. We've discovered how old the universe is, 13.8 billion years. I mean, that's just, in, you know, compared to our lifetime, that's just an incredible amount of time and how vast it is. I mean, what we can see is we can see about 15 billion years, and we think the universe is vastly larger than that. So. Those just two things themselves 
are reflections of the eternality of God. I mean, in a finite way, I mean, um, that the universe is very old, which would be expected if you have an eternal God, and vastness of God. So a finite reflections of God's unbounded infinity. So I do think they even further declare the glory of God and all this fine tuning does too, and all the intricacies of the laws of nature themselves. Incredibly ingenious, they seem to be ingeniously designed and put together to all work together to get us a world we have. Does that help answer your question? Yes. All right. Um, Thank you. And your name is? Oh, Brianna. Brianna. Um, so if the goal of the universe is to have a life or a conscious life, why do you think that it seems like the majority of the universe is actually not optimized for that in the past? So yeah, only it seems like there's you know this little pocket that's optimized for life um, and a vast majority that's not. And one you know answer might be, well, maybe there is life elsewhere as well. But even in that case, it seems like there's still had a little pocket, so you gave the analogy of right. like Abraham Lincoln and the ink spill. So the analogy I'm thinking of is if you go to a hotel and the designer tells you, oh, this hotel has billions and billions of rooms and it was designed for you, but you can only go into one room or a couple right, rooms. Right, right. But you're, I, so that's a common thing people raise. And then I think what you have to ask yourself is why would you expect a creator to create a universe jammed full of life? Um, now, if we are engineers, we want to optimize things because we have finite resources. So if we're building houses and you know, only 0.1% of them get occupied, well, we're not going to make it financially. We have limited resources. But if you have infinite resources and you want to show your vastness and the beings that form to be able to see the rest of the universe, then there's no reason why you would necessarily want to jam it up with life. And there maybe is other life civilizations. I think it's likely there actually are because of God's infinity, but I wouldn't necessarily expect it all to be full of life and be optimized so every square inch, so to speak, has life because God is infinite and we're finite and we've got to watch our resources. So I just don't think that carries over to the case of God. Does that make sense? Okay, and Josh. My question is the question I asked as an undergrad team many years ago, and which is a version of the design God objection. Huh. And maybe one way of formulating it would be that kind of the way that we understand <coughs> consciousness is that uh -huh. it's based on complex nervous system. You know, right. It's based on complexity. So if we posit a designer behind our whole universe, our evidence suggests that that designer is going to depend on a complex right. Right. brain of you know, and that is going to have to be more finely tuned. Not just kicking back, right. just, just like the multiverse kicks back the fine tuning of the right. multiverse, the design hypothesis kicks back the fine tuning of the designer back so that it doesn't really solve. Okay, so this is an extraordinarily common objection. It goes way back to David Hume. So for people in philosophy, um, atheist George Smith succinctly summarizes the objection as follows. He says, if the universe is wonderfully designed, surely God is even more wonderfully designed. He must therefore have had a designer even more wonderful than he is. And Josh pointed that out in terms of fine tuning. We always see consciousness being associated with something that's fine tuned like the human um, brain, at least the consciousness we're familiar with. If God did not require a designer, then there's no reason why such a relatively less wonderful thing as the universe needed one. The idea behind the objection is that since explanation must stop somewhere, we are better off accepting the universe as the ultimate brute fact, even a fine-tuned brute fact, than God as the ultimate brute fact, since the latter just transfers the problem of design or fine-tuning up one level. And then I think to answer that, we need to look at why something needs fine tuning. So why do we think the picture on the left needs fine tuning? So we have an ink spot here, ink splotch. We don't think that needs fine tuning, it's all random. We need think this needs fine tuning because it's composed of a lot of different, you know, if you look at this, there's little black spots and then there's little white spots 
And they all have to be arranged just right in a very small number, relatively small <laughs> number of configurations compared to all the possibilities in order to get that picture. So it requires something to have some kind of parts that need the right arrangements. And that would be true if you believed in an anthropomorphic God, like God had a brain and a body, let's say, or even a finite mind, um, then like you believed in an alien, uh, we are just a, uh, people have these scenarios where there's these aliens and they're playing around with creating universes in a test tube. But then if that's your explanation of the fine tuning, then they fine tune their scenario. Um, and then who fine tuned the alien would be just kick the problem back again because the alien itself would have a brain that would need fine tuning. But the God of classical or traditional theism, however you want to put it, the God both East and West has always been conceived as infinite and unbounded and thus with little or no internal complexity. So God is a kind of like we experience ourselves as an age and an actor or center of consciousness. You all experience yourselves as centers of consciousness. God, it, you're kind of a singular center of consciousness that you experience yourself as. Well, God is a singular consciousness, not composed of all these complex parts that is unbounded in terms of God's consciousness, so therefore unlimited in knowledge. There's no limits on God's conscious reach. And God's agency and will, that's also nothing to bound it. So there's no internal complexity whatever to deal with. And this is not just something made up to answer the objection to the fine tuning argument. This is just simply what theists have always held. So it's part of the theistic hypothesis that God um, is at least very little internal complex. You know, some have taken it to absolute simplicity, which then runs into problems in the, like Aquinas and others in the medieval tradition. So God has always been held not to be composed of parts, so there's nothing to fine tune. And since God's attributes are infinite and unbounded, no complex laws, that might require fine tuning need to exist to determine the extent of God's powers, knowledge, and so forth. Like if God had limited power, God could create unicorns but not centaurs, then you'd need some set of laws or something that said why God could only do this and not that, then you'd be back to some kind of fine tuning. So I think it comes down on that score to this, which is more plausible to believe that there is such a being that's unbounded, or to believe it was just kind of all this was a lucky accident. And to me, this seems way more plausible here. That seems to me so implausible, the other one, that even though I can't completely understand how this could be the case, it seems a lot more plausible to me. Could you offer a little bit more on maybe the prior probability of this theistic hypothesis? You know, what is it about? Uh, you know, somebody might worry that this description is very intrinsically implausible, but I hear you saying that you're not seeing it as, as intrinsically implausible. Or not at least so intrinsically as plausible as this. So the difficulty is how to think about all these infinite attributes. Because So part of it is we're conscious. So it makes, I, I, actually I do that in the next slide. So I, one way I reason on this is Instead of going, you could have other arguments like you like the cosmological argument and other arguments for God. But here's often how I present it. So you could think either the ultimate foundation of reality is personal or impersonal. Like it's either just kind of brute matter, physical laws, or mind, consciousness. So if consciousness, if you take one of them, consciousness, like we experience is fundamental, then one is naturally led to the idea that this mind is infinite and unbounded, since any bound on the mind would be either by some law, in which case um, consciousness would not be fundamental, or it would be arbitrary. So once you have consciousness as fundamental and there's nothing, it's the most fundamental, then there's nothing to bound it. So it'd be an unbounded consciousness and will goes along with consciousness. 
they seem to go together, so it'd be unbounded will, so you get omniscience and omnipotence. And then there's a way of getting perfect goodness out of all that too, because uh, this is an argument due to Richard Swinburne. If you're un you have an unbounded will, you have nothing constraining your will, and you perceive something as good, the property of being good has a unique feature of being itself intrinsically desirable. So to perceive something as good already is self-motivating for an agent to bring it about. So, and this has been a thesis held by Plato, um, for instance, has a long history, this thesis. So it intuitively makes sense to people. Now, why do we do evil then? It's because we either are ignorant of what's good or we have contrary desires, like we have sexual desires. We know it's wrong. That itself gives us a motive not to do it, but we do it anyhow because we're overcome. We, we don't sufficiently resist these other desires, like to commit adultery or something. Okay, so um, then you can also get from that, um, I think, the perfect goodness of God, that you're good to go on your whole theistic view. And you might not agree with all those um, assumptions, like the good is self-motivating, but that set of assumptions is certainly a lot more plausible in my mind than thinking this was just all here. This incredible universe was here by chance. So the idea that it just, let's forget the multiverse for right now, that the universe is just here by chance and everything and you know, all these initial conditions were just perfect by chance and every, all the mathematical structure and how all the constants, okay, um, they would have to say it's more implausible to think that there can be an immaterial mind. Not just that it's merely implausible, it's just utterly implausible. But then to that I would say, well, didn't you, before you knew all this other stuff, before you're trained in science, didn't it seem plausible to you that your mind was something separate from your body? It was like, I mean, this reminds me of somebody, was, he was, she was a, um, a postdoc in neuroscience and I had, it was at University of Michigan. I suggested around a lunch table that maybe we, there was an immaterial mind. And she says, I can't even conceive of what a mind would be apart from the brain. And I responded to that, well, didn't you know you had a mind before you knew you had a brain? Well, certainly you did. So certainly we know what consciousness is apart from that. We know what the property of being conscious or aware is. So certainly it's conceivable because we did conceive of it before we knew all this science. So I say it's at least conceivable. Um, and unboundedness is conceivable, so I don't see anything unconceivable about it. They might think it's not plausible given what we know about how we, our own embodiedness. But then they would have to say, well, it's far more implausible. Now maybe, and maybe they don't get that, you know, they don't feel that it's implausible. Well, arguments don't work for everybody. But I just say, I'm gonna have to be autobiographical. Of me, it's just utterly implausible that all this world would, you know, work in this way. I'm trying to elaborate just that a little more because a lot of, there's a lot of philosophers who believe in what's called the regularity theory. And they think all, all the regularities that masses always attract each other, everything we see, there's it's just a brute fact. There's no underlying reason. To me, that's just fantastically implausible. Um, it's, and those who disagree with that, even the non-theists who disagree with that, say if you believe that, you'll believe anything, which is the way I feel about it. But you know, so there you just have to go back to your sense of things, your fundamental intuitions. So there is a point about the spiritual that some people have a more of a sensitivity to that's very natural for them to believe in a spiritual realm. Just like most people, it's natural for them to believe that there's moral truths, that there's moral skeptics. Yeah, and so and you can't prove, you know, certain things are right or wrong. You there would be really hard to offer any kind of proof of that except by appealing to other moral intuitions you have. So ultimately there is a point that people they have differing intuitions. That's what you learn to live with as a philosopher. Um, and I think it's very important to learn to live with that and not say they're bad people or that um, you might think they're blind. Because of course, if they're not perceiving what you're perceiving, oh. but you claim, but not necessarily as uh, 
um, using it as a derogat something derogatory about them because they're going to think you're blind to certain ways that you don't see what they're seeing, how implausible it really is there to be a God. So I think the best you can do is just articulate the reasons you have and recognize, I mean, one thing to recognize is that people that hold this other view, this is kind of a, it's, that's a rarity in terms of history and culture. Most people do have a spiritual perception throughout history and time. Most in, in, the, in the Western world, it's maybe not in certain countries, no longer the case. Like in China, it's one of the most atheist countries in the world, but you know, they've been drummed in <laughs> atheism for a long time. So maybe there's a good segment that don't. But it's not like a ridiculous thought to think it's plausible that God exists. Brianna? Uh, the, um, there's a Brianna, right? Yeah. Hey. Um, answer that you just gave her who designed God's uh -huh. reaction and appeals to like, classical theism mm -hmm. and God either having no parts or maybe having very few parts. And so I'm wondering for a theist who rejects divine simplicity or classical theism, um, if they would be able to use that kind of a response and to defeat that God. Well, I mean, it also builds in what you think about let you build into classical theism. I reject certain parts of what has been held in the tradition, like God's impassable, that God can't be influenced by us. So I wouldn't hold that. Um, I'm on the side of more open theism, which is, um, and that God is relational and can be influenced by us. So I want to be very careful about the use of the word classical theism, even though I use it here. But if they reject that, if they think God has a lot of parts that need to be arranged, then I just do think they get into this problem. So I think that actually the fine-tuning argument doesn't just give you a generic designer, but it actually gives you something much more specific, the kind of um, omnipotent, omniscient um, God that doesn't is a kind of singular consciousness without parts, and I think it also gets you to perfectly good because you, you, you need, God has to have a reason for creating a fine-tuned universe. It has to be built up with a hypothesis to be confirmatory. So I think I just wrote a paper on this that's being published in this volume. I forgot the name of the volume, but uh, anyhow, I can send the paper. If, if you want to get that paper, it's a paper that I try to show that how much you can actually get out of the design argument.